you took my opening away. <laughs> I knew I knew everybody would jump at that. Yes, if we look in the dictionary on the Jewish mother, we will see we will see Nina Katsev ah. as the lead in. Uh, you know, I, and I will tell you more about Charlotte Gainsbourg later, the actress, but. Uh, she definitely, she definitely takes the the latka in this one. Uh, anyway, uh, to get to the to the story itself, Promise of Dawn was uh, as a novel was uh, written in 1960. Uh, I will get in in a little while. I'll get into uh, Roman Gary himself, uh, but it, it's uh, the director of this film. His name is Eric Barbier, and he, he's done some interesting. He works in multi genres, and he just really uh, always wanted to do this book, uh, adapt this book as a film. And uh, you know, the opening line of the book uh, really, really gets to what we're talking about because the opening line of the book is the gods have forgotten to cut my umbilical cord. The gods have forgotten to cut my umbilical cord. What a great line, uh, especially considering our story. Uh, you know, it's an adventure. It's, by the way, it really, uh, it, it really doesn't fall into, interestingly enough, the autobiography category. And I will explain why as we go along, but it's an adventure, a coming of age story that covers the 20 years, only 20 years in the extraordinary life of Roman Gary spent with his mother. He owes this relentless, this relentless enterprise of the two of them to live a thousand lives, a thousand lives, to become a great man and a famous writer to his mother, Nina. It's the wild love of uh, his eccentric and endearing and over domineering mother that drives him to become one of the greatest novelists of the 20th century, to lead a life full of twists, passion, mystery. But this unconditional paternal love will also be a burden that he bears his whole life. We see them face challenges, move through these adventures and twists and turns across country after country. Their life is a parade of opportunities lost and taken advantage of, of reunions, of happy coincidence and unfortunate accidents. It's an abundance of every imaginable situation filled with a mix of eccentric characters. It was shot in five countries over 14 weeks, which is unusual for a film to, to uh, shoot in this day and age, to shoot as long as a month is unusual. Promise of Dawn takes us to Poland and Mexico in the 20s. Uh, well, the, the novel takes us, to, well, it does take us to Mexico, as you see, actually, it, it's in the 50s already, uh, but it takes us to Poland and Mexico, to Nice, to Paris in the 30s, the African desert, London, and the European theater of World War II. It's, uh, it, it is, to me, an altogether spectacular and intimate historical epic. Uh, like the book, the historical continuity in the film is totally disrupted. This is the way the book runs. The timeline passes from one period to another and back and forth uh, to another throughout the whole story. Uh, from his difficult childhood in Poland to his adolescence under Nice's son, uh, to his car career in the Air Force in Africa during World War II, it mixes the true and the false. Because like the book it was drawn from, when you tell a story of yourself, and where you came from, there is truth and there is falsehood and there is your version of the truth. There is his version of the truth, but I will get into some of the truth later. The film thrusts us into the story by way of Mexico, as we see during the Day of the Dead, an interesting production choice uh, because it's an appropriate many metaphor for a storyteller who is haunted by the ghosts of his past. We see Roman's wife finding him ranting about his brain, about a brain tumor and discovers the book on the way to the hospital. And like the novel, uh, the film uses the narrator's voice uh, and we hear Roman telling most of the story. Now his narrators tend to become unreliable because you're dealing with their idea of the truth and you're dealing with their memories. Uh, and sometimes those memories change. Uh, and we hear him comment, analyze and mediate uh, his path relating humorous, serious or tragic events. 
uh, with a tremendous amount of irony or tenderness. Uh, it serves to convey how we're going from one place to another, how we go from one meeting to the next encounter, from failure to success, from disappointments to happy surprises, from illusions to deceptions, all across all of their history together, evoking a man who's caught between two cultures, caught between his background, caught between France, who finds himself in difficult situations, often because of his double affiliation. In the book, in the book, uh, the hero, who is Roman, creates a mockery of himself in Poland because he pretends to be French and is expected to be. Another time in France, he sees himself equally mocked and humiliated because he's a Polish Jew. Uh, and that comes to the forefront when he joins, when he's inducted into the army. We see how Nina creates a mini fashion empire in Poland only to wind up bankrupt and a victim of anti-Semitism. And she does it in a fabulous way. Uh, she was inventive uh, in real life, as we'll find out again later. As does, and Roman also uh, experiences the pangs of pre-adolescent love. If you remember how he gets, he experiences anti-Semitism at the same time he falls in love with another, you know, 10 year old girl. Uh, moving to Nice, we meet more eccentric characters. The chambermaid that initiates his sex life only to be interrupted by his mother, one of the funniest scenes in the movie. And the introduction of Monsieur Zaremba. I love Monsieur Zaremba, uh, the would-be artist. And I love it when he checks into the hotel. Remember, Nina gives him a dirty look when he says he's an artist because he's an artist, he won't be able to pay. And it, it, she knows he's a failed artist because he has money. Uh, and he, be, he only paints cherubs. If you remember, he was only painting cherubs. Uh, and uh, Roman unsuccessfully tries to get his mother to fall in love with him so it would take the weight off his back uh, as, as he relates it. Uh, and it's failed and he winds up leaving. And then there is Nina's crazy and hilarious desire to send him off to Berlin to assassinate Hitler. If you remember, she has this plan when he comes home and you only have to do this. You learned how to shoot when you were a young boy. You'll get in, you don't worry. He buys a one-way ticket to Berlin and then he's sitting on the beach the next day and his mother runs out and says, no, it's not a good idea. <laughs> it was very funny, very funny. We watch him achieve his first success and his encounters with a number of women and his eventful induction into the Air Force, again, coming face to face with anti-Semitism and being reminded, at least he didn't wind up like Dreyfus. At least if you remember his commanding officers, at least you're not gonna wind up like Dreyfus. Uh, he is saved from death by a phone call thinking he hears his mother's voice. But in truth, it was a garbled phone call and he couldn't understand it. And he finds out his mother's been sick. Uh, we witness his exploits escaping to England and fighting a duel with a Polish soldier that lands him back in, it lands him in South Africa. Who we, and he eventually uh, takes a horse into the desert, saves an old woman. Uh, the tribe welcomes him in as a hero. Uh, and then he's and then he comes back and he's 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 arrested when he tries to shoot mosquitoes off the wall. Uh, he's going nuts. Is basically what's happening. Uh, and while he's in jail, he has a conversation with Nina. Nina comes to visit him in jail, or so he thinks. Uh, he struggles with typhoid, uh, and uh, Nina comes to visit him there in the hospital. Oh, by the way, we did. We did pass over the fact that she does uh, have him uh, converted to, to uh, Roman Catholicism along the way. It was something. It was something they did to protect him. Uh, and in truth, it was to protect him. He never really admitted to it. He was always Jewish in his soul. Uh, anyway, he holds his imaginary, and then finally he cracks up altogether on the typhus, runs out naked. Into the, into the arms of the, 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 the nurses. And finally, uh, he, he, you know, and they, after fighting that duel, he winds up back, he's, he's on bombing missions uh, and uh, writing a novel. Uh, 
his European education and sending letters to Nina and getting answers, which she finds cryptic because she never mentions his novel. If you remember, he says, I found it surprising that she never mentioned my novel, uh, which sold in England at the time. Uh, an English publisher picked it up. Uh, and then finally, he becomes a real hero by saving his pilot blinded by enemy fire and guiding the plane to safety, making him that hero and winning the Medal of Liberation pinned on by none other than de Gaulle. Uh, you know, he returns, he returns to Nice finds that the hotel is no longer his mother's. Uh, they know nothing of her. He goes to the hospital. He deals with Dr. Rosanoff, who, re who reveals the truth, that his mother had written 250 letters the night before she died. And uh, she gave it to a friend in Switzerland to mail one at a time to him so he would know, he would know she's alive. She didn't want to scare him. Uh, which is which is really, you know, this is called fabulism. This is, you know, invented, invented realism uh, to make the story that much richer. Uh, anyway, uh, we come back to Mexico. He finds that his brain tumor was nothing more than an ear infection from a piece of bread and guacamole he stuck in his ear so he didn't have to hear the noise outside. Uh, the film, you know, has all of these bright, funny moment, moments, it twists them with these tragic moments. It's, it's really a very interesting story. It leaves us with the final line in the film and the novel, it's also the fun, is with maternal love, life makes a promise at dawn that it can never hold. Life makes a promise at dawn that it could never hold. Well, now I give you the lowdown on the true Roman Gary because it, 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 it is as interesting as the book but somewhat different. Uh, he was born in Vilnius. At the time, Vilnius was part of the Russian Empire uh, in 1914. Uh, in his books and his interviews, he presented many different versions of his parents' origins. Uh, you know, he was on talk shows. He, 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 he went all over the place. Uh, his ancestry was always in question, uh, his occupation and his own childhood. His mother, her real name was Minna, Minna Ashinska, uh, which was changed to Katsev uh, when she married uh, his father, Arya Lieb Katsev. Uh, and and um, his mother died, truthfully, in 1941. And his father left, abandoned the family in 1925, which is when Minna or when Nina and Roman apparently moved to France, uh, or moved to actually go back to Warsaw and then to France. Uh, his father was a Lithuanian Jew, his mother was a Russian Jew. And he abandoned family 25 and remarried and his father died in 1942 after his mother. Uh, Roman Gary later claimed that his actual father, now get this, and this comes into the movie, it's hinted at in the movie. He claimed that his actual father was the celebrated actor and film star, Ivan Mosjukin. Ivan, if you remember the silent film star they went to the movies to see, was Ivan Mosjukin. He was a real live person. His mother, uh, his mother uh, was an actress. Uh, Minna was an actress and she had worked with him and uh, when, when she would, and, and to whom he bore, he bore, Roman bore a striking resemblance. So it's sort of hinted at in the film, if you pick it up, that he may be most Jukin's son uh, because she spent time with him. He appears in both the book and the film, but more, more in the film because we see the pictures of him on the screen, and he puts himself in Mujukin's place. Uh, if you remember those little clips that we see. Uh, anyway, uh, they were deported. The family was deported to central Russia in 1915. They stayed in Moscow, in Moscow until 1920, returning to Vilnius, then to Warsaw. When Roman Gary was 14, that's when he and his mother emigrated to Nice. Uh, and uh, she did convert him to Catholicism so that they would fit in, so that there would be no question or fear of anti-Semitism at the time, at least they thought. 
Uh, anyway, uh, the the and and it was wonderful in the film. If you remember the scenes when we see him jump in age, the first time he jumps into the water, and he comes out older, and then later on when he's washing his face and there's the picture of Tolstoy on the wall and he looks up and now he's a young man. I love those the, filmically. They're wonderful ways to transition. Uh, anyway, uh, she never knew. Uh, she never knew that her son would become one of the major French writers and figures of the 20th century, that he would become a diplomat in Europe, then secretary to the French delegation at the UN. Uh, and in 1956, he became consul general in Los Angeles, where he fell in with Hollywood. Uh, he would win the Prix Concours. Now, the Prix Concours is a literary prize that France bestows on uh, the novelist that they think is the best, has written the best novel of that year. Uh, it is, it is as, as high an honor as the Nobel Prize for Literature, but it can only be awarded once. It only can be awarded once to an author. However, Romain Gary is the only author that won it twice. He won it twice. Now here, here's to show you what a raconteur is all about. Uh, he won the first time for his novel called The Roots of Heaven. Now, if the title sounds familiar, it became a major motion picture in 1958, directed by John Huston and starring Errol Flynn, Trevor Howard, and Orson Welles, among others. And he wrote the screenplay for it as well. He won it the second time for a novel called The Life Ahead. Now, that title should sound familiar to you if you watch Netflix because Sophia Loren did a film in the past year called The Life Ahead. And that story is based on a book that he wrote before, which became the Academy Award winning film, Madame Rosa. It was the best foreign language film uh, back in, and, and it starred Simone Signore as Madame Rosa. And the film that Sophia Loren did was again, a readaptation of that story. Uh, but he published the book under the name Emile Ajar, Emile Ajar, which, which is why he won the prize. They had no idea who Emile Ajar was, and he hadn't revealed it. He had the son of his cousin walk around France as Emile Ajar. So he would, there would be a phony author. And, but anyway, uh, later on, Minna never realized that he would be rich. Uh, oh, by the way, he also wrote the screenplay for the Oscar winning The Longest Day. He wrote, he wrote the screenplay for The Longest Day. Uh, he, was, he was very well known in Hollywood and he was friends with Olivia. He became friends with every major star and director while uh, he was in Hollywood. Uh, both with his first wife, Leslie Blanche, who I'll tell you about in a minute, and his second wife, Gene Seberg. Gene Seberg. Uh, but Minna never realized that he'd be rich, that he would have all these lovers, wives, everything that she wanted for him. All the things that they talk about in the book, uh, you know, she, she never realized. She only wanted him to succeed in creating this character that she had completely invented. She invented him when she stands out in the street and she says, he will be ambassador. He will do this. He will do that. And they're all laughing. Uh, but she imagined that a son would achieve greatness in his lifetime, uh, which gives the story so much resonance. You know, the story of a Jewish Polish immigrant choosing France as their homeland to the point that Romain Gary becomes the consul in the United States and a major literary figure it made a mockery. It made a mockery of all the sect sectarianism and the protectionism in France and elsewhere that flourishes today. When we think about nationalism and how, how immigrants are looked down upon, yet here he comes to France and achieves this status uh, is, is amazing, is amazing. Uh, Leslie Blanche, who was his first wife, was a British author, historian and traveler. She was a noted author. Uh, and she was married to Romain Gary from, and she was actually 10 years older than him. She was married to him from 1945 until 1963. 
Uh, but she died, believe it or not, in 2007, one month shy of our 103rd birthday. One month shy of 103rd birthday. He, he left her, he left Leslie for the actress Jean Seberg. Uh, and they were married in 1963. And after learning that Seberg had an affair with Clint Eastwood, when they made, during the filming of Paint Your Wagon, the musical film Paint Your Wagon, it was purported that she had an affair with Clint Eastwood. Gary ch uh, challenged him to a duel. He challenged him to a duel and Eastwood politely declined. Eastwood politely declined, as you can imagine. He died of self-inflicted gunshot wound, and that's true, on December 2nd, 1980 in Paris. Uh, he left a note which said that his death had no relation to Seberg suicide uh, because she committed suicide the previous year. I don't know how many of you are familiar, but she was linked to the Black Panthers uh, in the United States. And uh, the FBI really uh, blemished her as an actress. She wasn't getting work anymore and uh, she had committed suicide. Uh, but he also stated <laughs> In the suicide note, he left that he was Emile Jar, that he was Emile Jar, and it was actually it was he published a, a book uh, was published a year after his death, and it was called, entitled "The Life of Emile Jar," and it was very much in the vein of "Promise at Dawn," uh, in the way it was written. Uh, he created another life for himself. Uh, but obviously it all caught up with him. And he was only 60, by the way, uh, when he died, uh, a shame, uh, because he was, he was a, a marvelous writer. Uh, I mean, he wrote, he wrote uh, something like 30, 30 novels, uh, essays, uh, as well as achieving status in the French government uh, that was unheard of. Uh, not just for someone like him, but, you know, coming from a Jewish family because he was mocked. Uh, he did, by the way, the, the story in the film of his exploits in the, in the Air Force, the only part of it that's true, the, there's two parts that are true that we see in the movie. One was that they wouldn't promote him in that class of 300. He was the only one that would not receive a commission. However, he was made a sergeant. He was made a sergeant. Yes. And the 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 uh, what happens when the when the plane blows up by accident? He's you know that he gets the that never happened. That's made up in the book. And the the only other true thing that happened because he never went into the desert and saved the woman. He never did those things. Uh, was uh, actually saving the pilot who lost his sight uh, during the flight. Uh, he actually did that. He actually received uh, the uh, Medal of Declara uh, uh, the Declaration of Honor, of Independence from De Gaulle. Uh, that's all true. Uh, and he did write his first novel while he was in England. Uh, went on to become a bestseller in France as well. Uh, a European Education, which was a book about the resistance in France. Uh, and uh, he went on, as I said, to write 30 more novels uh, and screenplays, uh, as I said. So he led a, a quite an illustrious life. The actors in the film, uh, Charlotte Gainsbourg, uh, she is one of France's top actresses. Uh, she also does, she does international film, uh, but she is the daughter of uh, one of France's most famous singers. Uh, Serge Gainsbourg. Serge Gainsbourg was a major, major star in France, a singing star in France, probably the most popular uh, singing star to have come out of modern France. Uh, he, he died, also died at a young age. Um, and his her mother, her mother is, uh, I don't know, many of you are familiar with, uh, you know, Hermes makes a, a, a bag, uh, a bag called the Birkin bag. Uh, it's named after Charlotte's mother, Jane Birkin. Jane Birkin was a model and an actress back in the 60s, the 50s, the 60s. Uh, she became an actress later on. 
Uh, she was married to Serge Gainsbourg and their daughter is Charlotte. And in fact, Charlotte looks very much like her mother. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and she's had an illustrious career. Now, the actor who plays Roman, Roman is, uh, his name is Pierre Nene, Pierre Nene, and he's a wonderful actor. Uh, he's one of France's, he's, uh, he's, he's quickly becoming one of France's biggest stars. Uh, three years ago, he played Jacques Cousteau uh, in a film called The Odyssey, which was also well received. Uh, he does comedy, he does drama. Uh, he was in a wonderful film that I highly recommend called Franz, F-R-A-N-T-Z. Uh, I believe it might even be on Canopy. I know it's available on, uh, I think it's available on Amazon. Uh, it's called Franz, F-R-A-N-T-Z. It's about World War I. It's in black and white. It's a World War I story, beautifully told uh, about a man and a woman and mistaken identities. And it's, uh, he stars in that and he plays a wonderful role. Uh, so I, I, I highly recommend it. Uh, so then you have two great actors giving two great performances in this film. Uh, the other one is, is Jean-Pierre Darussine, who plays Zaremba, uh, the wonderful artist, who's a terrific French actor. And it's, a, it's almost like a wonderful cameo for him in the film. Uh, but the rest of the cast, is, is not that well known, except there is one, uh, one uh, actor in there. The one who plays the blinded pilot is also becoming one of the fastest uh, rising stars in France. Uh, Finnegan, his name is Finnegan Oldfield. Uh, and he's in, appeared in a lot of uh, really award-winning films in France. So uh, there you have the story of Promise of Dawn and the story of Romain Gary. Uh, and uh, you should, if you want, delve into his, his award-winning books, uh, which have also become films, The Roots of Heaven and The Life Ahead, uh, two wonderful stories. Uh, so any, any questions, any comments? I'd like to open it up to the group. If anybody has anything they'd like to add or say. Somebody going to start? Uh, <laughs> sure. Kelly? Yeah. What was the real reason that he committed suicide? They don't know for sure. He had he had problems. He was he uh, as well as Emil Ajar, He worked under other names. He had about two or three other names uh, that he applied to to different novels uh, that uh, he he used. Uh, but he was always he was always haunted by his mother. I mean, that's true. That's what led him to write the novel. Uh, so, but they don't really know. He wasn't sick. They don't know that he was sick then. I couldn't, I couldn't ascertain that, uh, but his ashes were spread over the Mediterranean. I will tell you that. Uh, yeah, Marilyn. Um, regarding the mother, uh, I mean, his perception of who she was and, and how he re remembered her, you just wonder if if she wasn't the way she was, would he have been as successful as he was? Uh, that's a great question. Is is because well, she was an actress. We know that, and and uh, so she she probably imbued him with a lot of a lot of her feelings about being an actor. And 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 the answer is, I don't think he would have become who he was without that. her. She was as much a fabulous as he was. Uh, I think, you know, I think she invented him and he invented her. I think they invented each other. Uh, he invents her after her death. He reinvents her. Right. But I think she invented him. Uh, I think she imbued him with a lot of his craziness. Uh, and, and yes, so I, I think that's a, that's a reasonable, a reasonable assumption. Uh, Linda. You had some yeah, I viewed that a little differently. I thought that she was suffering from some mental illness. <laughs> I was looking, I was looking at a, a a different side of her because at one time she even says to him, I gave up my acting career for you to leave him in that Jewish guilt. And um, I agree with both of you though. I don't know if he would have been what he was without her, but she just didn't seem well. <laughs> I mean, it was, 
a Jewish mother to the nth degree. And well, well, you know, see, that's, where does mental that's, illness come in? Well, but that's why I say there's no mental illness because if you're a Jewish mother, you can't be mentally ill. It's calculating. Well, this is the degree. It's, <laughs> it's what degree? She invented the term. <laughs> she invented the term according to the story. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's 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 it is yes I think that but she, she kept was, him she, going with guilt or something that he at, there were times when he disliked her but he couldn't oh, go sure. against that and I don't know if anybody noticed this at the there was a scene with um, a feeling of anti-semitism I don't remember which scene it was but the music in the background <laughs> was the Andrews sisters song by me yes. yes yeah that's when he was I was laughing at that yeah that was when he was at the club in London and he got mixed up in the duel with the Polish soldiers right uh, right yeah he had that that English but the music that, was so <laughs> the, well the music was terrific but yeah there's a great line that he delivers he says now I'm forced to fight with men over a woman that I want to go away. <laughs> she didn't stop talking. But it's also, there's that wonderful scene and you talk, she was obsessed. I would say she was obsessed with, with wanting to make him into what she believed he oh, would yeah. be. I mean, making that squirrel coat, uh, which was very funny, uh, <laughs> the silver squirrel tail coat. Uh, and 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 him imagining, you know, he's imagining that he's he's this great movie star and everything else. It's what his mother wanted for him. He's a man, and he was burdened with that guilt. He but he wore it. That's the, the thing. He wore yeah. it. Yes. Yeah, and Marilyn. It also, it also led to him having difficulties with relationships, especially with women. Yes. Yes. He he definitely he definitely had had trouble. Uh, well, he married a woman ten years older than him, which you know was he's looking for another mother uh, in a way. Uh, she took good care of him uh, while they were married, as we saw in the even in the film briefly. She was also she also became the the editor of Vogue uh, back in the fifties. Uh, she was the editor of Vogue. So she was very, very popular and very, uh, very well regarded uh, in England. Uh, but yes, uh, and also there was that great scene when, when you know, he witnessed her doing crazy things. You're right, Linda. I mean, but he also witnessed tragic moments when he follows her uh, to the Polish woman's house. Right. And the woman said, I never should, I shouldn't have dealt with you you're, because you're a Jew, you know, and, and she never paid her. Uh, you know, it showed how they treated her and he saw that. And I think that affected him, mm -hmm. you know, it certainly did. within the it context did. of the story. Uh, and later on, when they're sitting in the antique shop and she's telling him it's a Russian, it belonged to Russian nobility, he says, I sold five of them last week, you know, and, and but he offers her a job uh, selling for him, uh, you know, and then they wind up with a hotel. Uh, she must have talked her way into a lot of things, obviously. Uh, Clara uh, had some interesting, she said, was well, mother crazy? Well, we, at one point she expects him to die for her and defend her. Yes, yes, she, she expected him to go all the way, uh, so to speak. Definitely, definitely. Uh, anybody else? Nobody? Wow, I'm surprised. Is that scene true about Hitler? Her sending him off to kill him. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Hollywood put in. Yeah, you gotta you gotta take a lot of what he says with a with a with a large grain of kosher soul. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, well how are you doing? Uh, what's it? Oh, hello? It went, to, it went let me just let, take this. I've got this movie thing on. I you know to uh. show as a movie review. Anyway, I went with Wilma today. We went to see oh. Price. Okay. Um, uh, I have a question. Dora was saying something. Yeah. Yeah, Dora. Uh, but in the in the real life, was she, was it true that she became you know a owner of a hotel and that mm -hmm. she was so? Was it true or it's put in the? It's, let me put it to you this way: It's questionable. It's questionable. Okay. A lot of mm -hmm. what he puts in the book is questionable. 
uh, you know, it's fantasy, she, fantasy, right? He wanted yeah, her to, yeah, to he, succeed. I, he wanted her to succeed. Yeah, he something. wanted to paint a beautiful picture of, her, you know, as crazy as she was. He wanted to show that she was inventive, that she was, you know, she would do anything. Uh, they don't exactly know. Uh, they didn't follow him. His really the the only things that they could trace down were was when he was inducted into the army. By the way, he didn't he didn't go to law school in Paris. He went to law school in Aix en Provence, in Aix en Provence, uh, and he was on the faculty there as well. There are records of that. Uh, he did go to law school, uh, but it's shady. They can't, they couldn't really pin down what was true and what was not true because he told so many stories mm -hmm. that he wouldn't tell you which one was real. So there's no record that she owned the hotel. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but it makes it interesting. It makes it, yes. you know, exciting that, that she as, succeeded as, finally. I mean, she suffered so much, you know, she... She she went bankrupt and and then in the did scene where they had to take all the furniture and everything and take it down the the lamp that crystal lamp. Yes, yes, yes. It's all sure. for dramatic purpose. It's all for yes. dramatic purpose. The right. the interesting the interesting thing is what authors do. I mean, you know, this raises into question what great authors do, uh, especially Jewish authors who portray their mothers. Uh, let us look at no no further than Philip Roth mm. and uh, Portnoy. Uh, you know, there he also paints who he considers the ultimate Jewish mother. And when questioned, you know, because people really, really, uh, you know, the novel was both praised and condemned. Uh, and it was condemned. A lot of people, he said, how can he, how can he deal with his mother this way? And he said, because that's not my mother. That's the way I imagined my mother. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's in a way maybe getting back at her, who knows? But the, the, the fact is, you know, he does that. Uh, Bruce J. Friedman is a wonderful book called The Mother's Kisses, uh, written by uh, a terrific popular novelist back in the 60s, Bruce J. Friedman, uh, who wrote Scuba Duba, the play. Uh, but he, he talks about his mother uh, and what she did to turn him into a great writer. Uh, it's a similar story uh, about a crazy theatrical mother uh, and uh, what she does to the point where he imagined that having his leg amputated so he can get away from her. Uh, I mean, it was just, they were just, it's so it's the insanity that these mothers create. You know, it's, it's, it goes back to what Marilyn said. Would he have been who he was without her? The answer is no. Philip Roth wouldn't have been the author he was without his mother. Uh, it's true. It's true. It probably is uh, when one looks at it. Um, you know, well, it's the most shocking thing, though, was to find out it was true and that this was biographical. Yeah. Uh, well, it's semi autobiographical. <laughs> but I mean, you know, I never expected that. Oh, yeah. The fact that the fact that it, it, is, it is a memoir. It right. is a memoir. Uh, definitely. Uh, is a Bonnie memoir. Smith wrote, Bonnie Smith has a comment in chat you might want to look at. Sure. I feel he was unable to lead his own life. Mm. He, he was in his own prison. His ambition and successes were a result of pleasing his mother. He was devastated that she did not know that he achieved many of her wants. Yeah. Think when she died that his balloon of pleasing and achieving was deflated, eventually led to a suicide. Possibly, it was many years later. Uh, so I can just kind of say, what are some of you, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but the, the, the idea, yes, because he was totally destroyed when the doctor tells him the story of the letters uh, and realizes that she never did know she never did know what success he had already achieved. And this was while he was still in his 20s uh, that he achieved that success. Uh, he was about 30 years old already, but he was, he was still, you know, he was still a young man. And to achieve so much success by that point uh, was, was sad. Uh, it, it gave, it, it gave a, a very melancholic, uh, you know, little piece to the ending, uh, towards the ending. Uh, and the idea of the, you know, the idea of the infection, you know, he wanted to shut out the noise. 
Maybe he also wanted to shut out everything else uh, at that point and winds up, you know, thinking he's got a brain tumor, uh, but doesn't, but doesn't, uh, you know, and he winds up on the bench. You know, it's as if he's talking to himself when Leslie sits down next to him. If you remember, he seems to be and realizing, uh, you know, what has happened to him because he, he had written the book at that point. He had just finished the book, if you remember. And, uh, you know, he didn't want her to read it at first. And he said, it's terrible, it's terrible. And she reads it and says, it's a great love letter. He thought she saw it as a great love letter uh, to his mother. Uh, in a way it is, you know, to recount the story like that, you know, even though you're making up a lot of it is still, uh, a way of inventing his mother, a way of inventing his mother and making part of it real. Yeah, Marilyn. Did she really write those letters in real life? Not wanting. To oh, no, no, him, that's not but true. That was just fiction. Yeah, that's fiction. That's fiction. You know she didn't write 250 mean? letters the night before no, she died. No, not 250, but did she write in? Did he not know no. that she had died early? No. Not, not the letters. But no. She did not know. Mm -hmm. Because she died, she died even before he became a hero. She died in 1941. It was oh, before okay. he, the, the, what happened. But, uh, no, he, he, you know, that's why I say he invented part of her, uh, which embellishes the story, you know, which is why, but yes, in context of the story, we can understand she's a little bit crazy. Uh, she's obsessed. Uh, she's compulsive. I mean, we see all of these traits uh, coming out and then understanding why he was, became such a Michigana. Uh, we understand it. We understand it. Uh, but uh, so anybody else? Well, I see also <laughs> Bonnie's asked me uh, for some of my favorite movies. Uh, well, it's a list. It's a long list. Uh, as I said, the two I named tonight, you can see I don't have a particular favorite. There's a lot of good ones out there. Uh, I will tell you, we were discussing before all of you came in. Uh, there's a film on Netflix, which I recommend called Passing, Passing, yeah. uh, which is also based on a novel from 1929. And, and I, I advise you if, you, if you do watch the film, uh, after you watch it, you can go on, I believe it's Wikipedia really plots out the book. If you look up the book uh, and the author, who's an interesting story in and of itself. Uh, so I recommend that. Ooh. Sounds okay. like a tape recorder. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, uh, and, and one of my favorite, I don't know whether they're trying to say something or not. They, they have to mute themselves. If somebody, yeah, yeah it's okay. they mute it. Yeah. Uh, is the next film I'm discussing Bliss? No, it's not. Uh, it's the, because we, we, we couldn't do that one because of Thanksgiving. The next film I'll be doing, in fact, is, where is that coming from? Uh, trying to say please mute it. I think yeah. if you put, Ed, if you put it into the chat, I'll see it there. If you can put, yeah. Can't understand you, Ed. If you put it into the chat, we can read it if you'd like. It seems to be trouble with your audio. Uh, okay, anyway, uh, my next film, the next film we'll be, we'll be uh, discussing is uh, from a book that was written by Jack London, believe it or not. Uh, the film is entitled Martin Eden. Uh, and it, it is a, it was a major award winner two years ago. Uh, it won the Italian Academy Award for Best Film. Uh, the award is known as the David D. Donatello Award. Uh, it was adapted. Uh, the novel was up. Oh, there's Ed's comment. Let me see. I second the recommendation about passing. It is extraordinary. Thank you, Alice. Thank you. Uh, anyway, uh, Martin Eden, uh, the book was written in 1909, uh, but it's set during, this is, as you watch it, you'll realize it as it goes along. It's really the time frame within the film 
set in Italy is not specified. So it's really taking place over a great deal of time in Italy. Uh, and Martin Eden uh, is a passionate, enthralling uh, story. Uh, it's, it's what you would call a fresco. It is, it is in the tradition of great Italian classics. If you think back to the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the great Italian movies like The Leopard uh, or uh, um, uh, the, the, uh, the great neorealistic films, uh, Bicycle Thieves, True Shine, uh, even some of Fellini's films. Uh, this goes back to those kinds of films. Martin, Martin Eden is a self is self-taught comes from the working class uh, with dreams of becoming a writer and marrying into wealth. Uh, the dissatisfactions of working class toil and, the bourgeois, and his bourgeois success lead to his political awakening and the conflicts that will ensue. Uh, it is, it is, a, it is a, a very expressionistic story. It's also impressionistic. Uh, it's beautifully shot. Uh, the music, uh, the characters uh, are all rich. Uh, the story itself at times feels somewhat abstract, but I think you'll be able to follow it. But it's a story that's worth really discussing. Uh, and I will, I will really dig into it. Uh, it, it it's a great story. Uh, it's being considered a modern masterpiece. Uh, it, 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 just, it just, as far as cinema is concerned, uh, it's really, uh, it truly uh, takes a character and translates it from a novel uh, and reveals the Italian character. Uh, it's interesting how he takes an American novel uh, about an American who's doing the same thing and applies it to Italy uh, and makes the story so universal. Uh, so I think that's part of, part of the wealth of the novel. Uh, so I hope you enjoy it. Uh, and uh, is there, are there any other any other questions or comments that you have? I'll be glad to answer about film. Anything? Are we skipping next week? Yes, we are. Oh. Yes, we because are. It's Thanksgiving. Yeah, it's the day before Thanksgiving, and I don't want to interrupt your cooking or your eating. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I do wish you all a happy Thanksgiving. I hope you, you enjoy too. your Thanksgiving and I look forward to seeing you on the 8th uh, when we get back together. Uh, oh, there's the question I've been waiting for. Helene, Helene Mann has asked, will you ever see Bliss? Uh, I've been searching for Bliss all my life. Um, <laughs> uh, it, yes, the answer is, the answer is yes, I will, I will uh, fit it in somewhere. It is a major award-winning film uh, and I will, I will definitely uh, fit it in. Uh, so yes, you can look forward to it. And, and, and again, is a great film to discuss, which is why it was in this grouping. So I will, I will have it for you. Uh, thank you for asking Elaine. Uh, anybody else? Anybody else? I no? Guess. Well, I'm here for you. Remember, you can always, if you're not already on my email list, you can always join my email list. You can get in touch with me uh, at my, at my uh, email. I usually answer you right away. Uh, you'll get your answer before you finish typing your question. Uh, and uh, I will be glad to discuss anything with you film, filmic related, filmic related. Uh, there's another, something else in the chat. Uh, yeah, that was that, that question about bliss. Yes. <laughs> okay. Anybody else out there? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank great you movie. For, great yes. movie. I know movie was amazing. I will, I will try and keep it up <laughs> for you. I will try and keep <laughs> okay. these films up for you. Okay. Come on. I, ha I have known you for many years when you were in FIU. I used to attend. I know, so, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you. so thank you so much for keeping up, you know, our knowledge of movies. My thank pleasure. You. I My keep pleasure. thinking about that duo with another type of a personality. She could have squelched her son with that strength <laughs> that she had. Oh, definitely. They had to have the right combo there. 
Yes, definitely. <laughs> but there are mothers who squelch their sons. I mean, well, like, that's more typical than this. It's a balance, not not necessarily necessarily more typical. I mean, I she was to the end. <laughs> but she empowered him in a she crazy did. way. She did. She did. But he had the right personality to be empowered, not he to could, be. He could have had a brother and could have totally squelched him. Right. Same mother. You just don't know. It's amazing. Yeah. I am putting uh, email. I'm putting my email into the chat for any of you who want to. If you don't get it, and if you contact the library, we will get the. Uh, I'm going to write it down here. There you go. And it's in there and uh, what you can do is, is uh, you can email me and uh, I will put you on my email list. Uh, so you'll get my newsletters as well. Wait a minute, Clara <laughs> said that he did have a real brother in real life. I thought he was an only child, I guess he wasn't. As far as I know, he had, it. well, that was his father had another child. His father had another child. Oh. Nina didn't, as far as I know, have another child. But he has a son, uh, oh, Diego. Diego. That's right. His son's That's name right. is Diego. Diego Gary. Uh, with Gene Seberg. Uh, with Seberg. Yes. yes, with Gene Seberg. Well, yeah, but Gene Seberg was not the crazy mother that he had. Well, she was crazy in a different in way. A she different was driven way, crazy. Not empowering, not not for she was for Jean, not for her child. Probably. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, he was born in 1962, Diego. Uh, and he, he he himself is involved with uh, with uh, film. We don't know how, but he's been involved. And he also deals with the protection of his father's name. And he's as good looking as his father was. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you well, so much. And thank happy you. Thanksgiving, everybody. Yes, thank happy you, Marilyn. Thanksgiving. Thank you. Ma Marilyn, yes. uh, where 